Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the next edition of the Sports Pro Stream Time Podcast. My name is Chris Stone, the community lead, joined as always by our CEO, Nick Meacham. And if you're listening to the, uh, this on a podcast, I would highly recommend you go to our YouTube channel so you can watch it in person. Because for those that do view it there, you'll notice that not only are we in person, but we're in a very special location. So we're very thrilled to be hosted by Robbie Lyle, the founder, CEO of AFTV, GFN. We're going to go to all those things. I've made a very brave decision. Um, anyone that's familiar with AFTV, if you're not uh, maybe based in the UK, because I know many of our audience is based around the world, they uh, follow Arsenal. So today, in celebration of West Ham's success, I'm wearing my West Ham jersey here on set, and I hope Robbie um, won't mind that, but he's been very um, open to letting someone in with a different color jersey. So, Nick? Yeah, yeah, and so especially fun, seeing as you're going to give us Declan Rice, you know I mean? That's all good. Thank <laughs> you. You know what I mean? You can wear it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if we're going to give uh, a big discount. We've got uh, a team to rebuild afterwards, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> it's uh, great to be here, and we've spoken to you before, but this will be the first time we've mm -hmm. done it in a podcast format, so do very uh, grateful for having you out as no, here in the you. studio today. And we got a little tour. Um, there's DR Sports. There's a new thing that you're doing with Formula One that we got to check out. You showed us the studio downstairs as well with the Man United channel, which I also wouldn't have guessed mm. was you know just below the Arsenal studio. So it's almost like being in Hollywood here because it's like four different buildings with four different studios. It's quite impressive. No, well, thank you very much, and um, thanks for coming down. And yeah, um, it's actually normally more busier than this during the football season. Uh, obviously, like especially on a day like today, right near to the weekend, you know we're getting ready for the weekend game, and you know there's lots of previews and reviews stuff going on. But um, obviously in the summer it quietens down a bit, but it's still busy. We still have like all the transfer stuff, and you know so. And obviously on DR Sports, which covers like all football, uh, we've got the uh, Champions League final tomorrow, so that's going to be a busy one. And maybe Nick, just you. Your broader scope, you know, maybe give a little taste of why people tuning into the episode that maybe haven't heard of AFTV, why they need to be paying attention to this particular topic and what we're going to go through, just to kind of, you know, whet their appetite a little bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, we cover a lot of what's going on across the the, the entire sports media landscape, whether it be streaming, social media, etc. Often we talk to a lot of broadcasters, we talk to a lot of sports properties, um, and we talk more a lot about platforms like YouTube and what their role is. And really, if you look at the role and the way sports tries to get value out of those platforms, it's still a work in progress in many ways. But AFTV and their story, for those that know, it's one of the, I think, the really exciting stories that everyone has been following for some time in terms of its growth and its impact that it has, being a platform that's not a, built around live sports, but in fact, well, in the sense of publishing it on the platform, but instead build around the fan. And quite often we, the sports industry struggles to think deep enough about what mm. fans really want. And turns out, uh, and AFTV sort of proven that, fans want to hear from other fans about what's going on and, and hear about reactions and opinions. And, uh, th and the story that we're going to hear a bit about today is, I think, one of the most exciting ones, not just because it's grown a huge audience, but indeed it's shifted from growing audiences to becoming a platform that's driving uh, a business and driving growth into other other spaces and other sports. Because um, I think it's always sometimes the challenge with social media and platforms like YouTube. People think, okay, well, growing an audience, that's one thing, but how do you turn that into something more? Mm. And these guys here are, are doing something pretty, pretty special. Absolutely. So, Robbie, before we jump into AFTV, maybe just give the our listeners a bit of a background uh, of your history before you actually got to this point you know I know I think you used to be a music DJ back in the day like it wasn't just always um, covering the sports world so you know yeah. we, we've had some interesting people on just a little bit about your background sort of how you got to this point yeah um yeah I did used to do music back in the day I was I used to do um, I was in the reggae industry and um, I used to do like MCing and DJing and um, yeah I did quite okay in it um, and then after that, when the music thing sort of started to peter out for me, I was like, I've got to go and get a proper job again now. <laughs> you know I mean? So um, I started to, uh, I worked in housing and then I became a surveyor, a building surveyor. And that was what I was, what I was doing up until I started uh, AFTV. But I've been a lifelong Arsenal fan. You know, I've been following Arsenal like literally all my life. And one of the things I, I wanted to do is I wanted to start a platform where you could hear from the fans because you know i just always felt that you never heard anything from the fans it was just always pundits or 
you know, uh, ex-players, you know, and journalists, which, which you know, they, they do a good job. But I was like, the fans also got a story to tell as well, you know? And every time you looked on TV, if they did use fans, they were just like in the background, they were just mannequins with, you know, it's almost like, yeah, let's get some fans in with their shirts on, you know? Say for instance, if it was like now and the West Ham winning the conference league, you'd have a couple of pundits and yeah, you know, let's get like 10 West Ham fans in the background mm -hmm. with their shirts on. And I'm like, well, I'd love to hear from those guys because they went to the game. Mm -hmm. And I want to hear about their emotion and you know, how did it feel being out there in Prague to see your team finally lift lift the uh, trophy? And, you know, so I, I'm like, why are we not hearing those things? You're hearing from an ex-player sometimes who played for West Ham, but might not have been a West Ham fan. He might just have, um, you know, that was his job at the time. And, I, and indeed, I used to hear, I remember listening one time to um, an ex-Arsenal player who was talking about Arsenal and they was asking him, his point of view on how he was playing and that. And he said, um, I remember the first thing that he said was, oh, I don't really get down there much nowadays, you know, since I've stopped playing. I'm thinking, but this is the guy that they're asking to give mm. expert analysis on it. Why didn't they ask a fan who goes to watch the club week in, week out? So it's those kind of things that was starting to, they were irritating me and I was yeah. starting to think, oh, God, you know, we should, we should have something when we hear from the fans. Yeah, well, that's a nice way to kind of segue into kind of my first question. I was almost looking at AFTV from where it began, and you talked about you have that idea, which is great, but I think a lot of people have ideas, but actually taking that idea and transitioning to something is a totally different process. Mm. So, you know, I kind of outlined the fact that, you know, this is one of four studios we're currently sat in, but maybe just go back to, okay, I've had this idea to now, how do I actually bring it to life? And maybe just describe the scale with like what you started at, because the first time I ever came across AFTV, it was Arsenal Fan TV, um, and you know, it was Troops, it was DT, it was all those guys. And as far as I could tell, it was almost just like, you know, someone with like a cell phone sort of thing. Like you maybe just kind of mm. give people an idea of like where it started from in terms of scale, just to, to get people an idea of how you went from that initial idea to kind of where we are today. Yeah, it was a bit up from a cell phone, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because um, <laughs> we, what we did is that, well, first of all, I had the idea and I was just like, I had it for a little while. But I had no, you know, I told you I worked as a surveyor and I had no experience in filming and no experience at all in editing. I didn't know nothing about it at all, I'll be honest with you. Um, even like YouTube channel, I had no YouTube channel, I had no Twitter, nothing. I was just a guy who went to football. That might, the, the, the one thing I knew I had good knowledge on was Arsenal because I watched them every week. Um, so I was like, how do I go about doing this? I tried to persuade a friend of mine who had a boxing channel called IFL TV that was really starting to to really, really grow. He's a big Arsenal fan as well. Me and him used to go, we, we were going to games since we was at Highbury and we were really good friends. We'd done some little businesses before. And I went to him, I wrote out a whole proposition what I think could work. And he just basically said to me that unfortunately, he goes, your idea looks decent, but I'm just too busy at the moment doing my boxing stuff. So I can't do it. So I was then after that, thinking, how am I going to do this? Because I, I ain't got a clue, to be honest. And then one day I just said to myself, you know, I'm just going to do it. Because sometimes if you want to do something, you just have to say, I'm going to do it. And then, you know, if you, that's the first step. And then maybe things might start falling into place. And then, and that's kind of what happened is that I went to a friend of mine who built websites for me before in the past when I did music. And I asked him, I said, could you build a, I've got, got this idea and I want you to build a website for it. And he said, okay, and he went away. And then he rung me back a couple of days later and he said, the idea you got, man. I said, decent idea, you know. He goes, who's gonna be doing the filming for you and stuff like that? I said, at this stage, I don't know, right? Um, maybe I might try and see if I can get to hire someone, I don't know. He goes, well, you know what? He goes, I know how to do filming. He goes, I know how to do a bit of editing as well. He goes, I do some little part-time work sometimes at a little local, um, studio that does adverts like low budget advert things so i said okay so he borrowed a camera and he borrowed a microphone from there and we just set off to the emirates and started interviewing fans one week so that's literally how it got started i remember the camera wasn't even a digital camera because i remember when he bought it round, i was like hey that looks <laughs> impressive man i go that looks like them cameras they use on tv it's yeah. big it was a big thing 
Well, what I didn't realise, right, is it was just like one of them cameras that you put these little tapes in them. And it was long. So, like, you, if you filmed an hour, you had to wait an hour for it to process. <laughs> it was, honestly, where, the amount of nights we spent up waiting for that, you know, you go away to a game and get home at two in the morning. We've got all this footage and then we've got to wait for it to process, yeah. then edit it. The amount of times, like, I, I had about an hour of sleep before going into work. You know, and those times I had to be in a lot of meetings, you know. And so, so when... <laughs> I'd be falling asleep. <laughs> but, um, when was that, Robbie? So how long ago was that now? That's, we're talking now, this is my, this is my 11th year of doing it. it was, we started it um, in 2012. Yeah. So 10 years ago, just over 10 years ago. And was it originally on the YouTube platform? Because obviously yeah. you um, doing the download, downloading it manually, and then going through that process... Um, when did it become more real time and you start moving into the more live stuff that you ended up being quite some the live good. stuff was like a few years in um, yeah. but the we, we sort of moved to a digital camera so after about six months I was able to sort of um, get some money together and I, I got a digital camera and then also the problem we used to have back in the day as well was like, like our laptop was like you know, it was not built for editing and stuff like that. So it would take an age. Like everything was just, took so long. When I compare it to how quick we do stuff now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was the, the live stuff and things like that sort of came along later on because the, it's, it's as technology has, has improved in, on platforms like YouTube, you know what I mean? It, you know, they've really refined things like live and that where it's just, got easier to mm, do mm. the just quickly on that again the so you launched the platform I'm always curious because a lot of people try and launch platforms and typically either their energy wanes or the platform is not it's not, they're not getting the reception or the results they expect and kind of give up on it like that happens a lot in podcasting mm. video etc what was when did you get to a point in those first couple of years where you're like okay you know we've been giving we've given this a fair shot and it's working now like we're actually we're really happy was it from Day one, was it six months in? Was it actually you were just super committed to it and it wasn't until a long, lot longer into the journey that it started working? When did you start to see that? Okay, mm. I think we're actually on, we are onto something, a validation, I suppose. Yeah, I think, you know what? Almost straight away, I could see there was something in this because when we did our first videos, um, the first game we did, we played Tottenham, which obviously, you know, local derby, massive game. And, you know, the video, we beat Tottenham and the videos did pretty well. You know what I mean? They got like, you know, when I say pretty well, in, you know, some of them getting 50 views, some 100 views, that would look ridiculous now. Yeah. But we were high-fiving each other and saying, oh, this is, this is brilliant. And what I noticed straight away is that people that we were interviewing were sharing the videos. Mm. So I was like, oh, this is pretty cool because this is what this platform's all about. In, in YouTube is sharing videos are actually got the people who are actually in the video sharing it as well. So that's gonna, you know, so I'm like, potentially, if we keep doing what we're doing consistently over a period of time, I think this is definitely gonna work. I mean, I was still working at those times full time in my job. So it wasn't until about, I'd say about three years in, two and a half, three years in that I'm like, yeah, that I feel the time is right to go full time. and. Even then, it wasn't, you know, you, a lot of people ask me this question and they say, did you sort of get to a stage where you were making more money here that you just said, oh, I don't need the job? It wasn't that, that wasn't the case at all because the job I was doing was quite a decently paid job. I had mortgage commitments and stuff like that and family commitments. And I'm like, I'm still not making the money on this side, on, on, on the AFTV side. But I feel that if I give it my 100% commitment, I can surpass what I'm making on this side and I can grow, which was more important to me than even just the making money. It's like I can grow a business. I can grow something that's going to be sustainable and something that's going to be, you know, what my dream is to be, a, you know, almost to be a new age broadcaster, right? So I was like, I feel I can do that. But I got to leave this job now. It's, it's I'm struggling now, you know what I mean? Because I'm going into meetings, I'm starting to fall asleep. I'm a, and I'm and I'm a person that when I work somewhere, I don't want to take the mick either. I want, I want people to respect the work I'm doing. So I was like, I need to 
leave that job. And funny enough, I saw, I, was, I got onto the tube the other day and I saw, saw, saw my old boss. <laughs> and he goes, that's what you, he goes, he, goes he, he was saying, I'm really proud of you and that. And he's going, and he goes, I knew, always knew you was up to something. Yeah. <laughs> because like, um, they'd say things to me, like videos would come out. But I never really wanted to tell him what I was doing because obviously I'm in a job as well. So videos would be coming out and going viral and stuff like that, right? And they come to me and say, Robbie, we saw you in a video <laughs> at the weekend. It was you, you were interviewing a guy and it was an Arsenal game. They knew I was a big Arsenal fan anyway. Yeah. And I was going, oh yeah, yeah. I was going, yeah, I go, what it is, it's my friend's thing. And I'm just helping him out. And that's how I used to always tell him. <laughs> so I started to get to the stage where I, I, I got to, I got to leave, you know, because I was juggling the two. I'd like, yeah. Say like now, for instance, transfer season, I'd be driving. So in my uh, job, one of the good things about it is that like, I had to go to check various properties, right? My building surveying. So I'd be driving and I'd be listening to the radio sometimes, right? And I used to wear a suit at work and I'd carry with me an arsenal top and that in the back and I'd have a little mini tripod that I could put my phone onto and, and do some little breaking news things. So I'd be driving in my car and they'd be like, oh, Mesut Ozil's been linked with a move to Arsenal or whoever. And then I'd be like, geez, that's, that's big news. And then I'd pull over somewhere. <laughs> I'd take my suit, my shirt off and thing, I'd put the Arsenal shirt on. And then I'd like film, but I'd only film the top off. So they, could, they wouldn't see my, yeah. my suit. <laughs> they wouldn't see my uh, trousers and, and thing. And I'd be saying, yeah, breaking news. You know what I mean? Arsenal close to making this signing. Uh, I'll do that. And then I'd then pop it over to like WhatsApp it over to my friend and I say, yeah, get that up as quickly as can on YouTube or I'll go back to work. Yeah. So I guess you know, <laughs> talking from brilliant. the beginning there and before we kind of really go in, into depth, maybe just give a bit of an idea to people listening, like where you're at now. So you talked about it, it used to just be you and a friend, like how, how big are you talking size wise now, you know, whether or not you want to include some of the influencers that you work with and then maybe just give people an idea of like, in terms of like mm. subscriber numbers, like the scale of the audience you guys have. Ooh, <laughs> well, there's a lot in there. Yeah. That one, that's a um, I think like permanent members of staff, we've got 22 um, across everything that we're doing. Like we've got a social media team. We've got like uh, uh, shooters and editors as you, you, you would do. You just sort of setting up for us here. And um, we've got a marketing team. So it's quite a big operation now. Yeah. That doesn't include like all the influencers and, you know, we, we've got some influencers who are full-time, but then there's many other influencers that, I mean, we did a show earlier yeah. and that was what, with an uh, influencer that we, he, he's freelances, you know, he's been working with us for years. So it's a big operation in, in that aspect. And then, um, you know, across all of our platforms, I mean, probably over 5 million followers across all the platforms. I mean, uh, YouTube's one point, over 1 1.5 million, Facebook over a million, over a million on Instagram. Our TikTok is, which is obviously quite a new platform for us, is blowing at the moment. Um, I think we're up to about six, over 800,000 on Twitter or on Twitch. We're, up, we're any, any platform that moves, we're on it. You know what I, mean? so. I think it's just worth like just getting people an idea of the scale. And, you know, we talked about it before, like I said, TikTok algorithm, don't know how it's working, but, you know, your guys' video that you did the other day with Danny Dyer kind of talking yesterday. about, yeah, yesterday. Yeah talking about the whole Jared Bowen song, which I won't sing on radio here, but uh, it's working, whatever the algorithm's doing. So the content's like continuing to come up, at least on yeah, my channel. Yeah, yeah, what was, what's the crazy thing about that is that we were actually at that event with like some real established broadcasters. I think, you know, I was, we were very fortunate to get in there to to um, be asking interviews as well. And like our content is like blowing more than everybody else's. So it just shows that, you know, the power of what we're doing, you know, um, without belittling any of those those broadcasters there. So, yeah, um, we it's it's been a crazy ride, and and everything continues to grow. We've got an app as well. And we, you know, we we're just um, building a brand new website. We've got a website. We're bringing a brand new one. So, yeah, it's, with the change in technology, you've just got to stay on top of it. Mm. It's like. This, because people, one thing I learned pretty early on is that you've got a lot of people consume their content on different platforms. You've got some people, um, they're Twitter guys and that's all they do. They, they watch their stuff on Twitter, they don't really do YouTube, right? So when we first started, it was just all YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. Mm. 
And then a lot of times what we do is we repurpose a lot of things for other platforms if we did say Facebook. But then we started to learn that, you know, no, there's some people, that's their platform. They don't really leave that platform or don't leave it much. To con so you've got to treat that platform with the right respect and treat that person who's watching on that platform as if that's the only place, the only place he's going to watch your content. So with, for instance, now with uh, TikTok, it's more of a younger audience that's, that's on there, but they're very loyal to that platform, you know? Um, and so if, you, if you're not creating content for it, you're, you're missing out on a big, a big, big audience. So just, are you, are you therefore, just to get to the nuts and bolts a bit further, are you streaming your live stuff on all of the, as many platforms as you can, or are you only doing that on select ones, and as well as then re the other the other non-live stuff? Yeah, most of, most of our live stuff we stream is on YouTube, but we stream live things on Instagram as well. We'll go live on Facebook, you know what I mean? So again, you know what I mean? YouTube is the biggest platform for lives. Um, but we are as well doing lives dedicated to other platforms as well. Just that the YouTube yeah. platform is, uh, cause they're so good with the live and like long versions of live really work well on there. Yeah. Most of our live stuff will be in there, but we do like, I did a live Instagram um, sort of story with uh, Kalechi who's one of our uh, guys who does a lot of contributing. He's from Nigeria. And we did a live yesterday with him on Instagram, which went written, I'm um, sorry, not yesterday, the day before, that was really, really good. So is that is that stuff more like reactive live versus the scheduled tip programming stuff that you do? Is that yeah. more YouTube basically? Yeah, I think YouTube's more, well, do you know what? It works two ways because YouTube is more scheduled live, but it can be reacting live as well. Because like if we, you know, like at the moment in the transfer season and if news was to break right now that, Declan Rice, I've got to say him again, is on his way to Arsenal, you know what I mean, to have a medical, we will go live with that immediately mm. on mm. on um, YouTube. Yeah? Well, I hope if they are going to make that announcement, they're not going to do it in the next 30 minutes. So <laughs> Rob, Rob, oh, off, uh, there's some other guys who could cover it here. <laughs> yeah. So, you know what I mean? But um, we would go, if that news broke now, we would go live with that. And the beauty of where we are as well is that we we got these studios that we, we do a lot of filming at, you know, but we also do a lot of filming outside the stadium. You know, I always say that the best set in the world for a football fan is the, is your club. You know what I mean? So when football fans see the Emirates Stadium in the background, like if you're an Arsenal fan, there's a lot of fans who've like never been there in their life. Mo the majority of fans who follow Arsenal. And I'm not just on about the ones who live abroad, I'm on about even ones in this country. The majority of them have never been to the Emirates. So they love to see you know, so we do filming, we do a lot of on location stuff as well, like, you know, filming at stadiums and stuff like that. So just, just wondering, um, we touched upon it, but just to rattle through it quickly, there's the different brands you have, the different um, channels. Uh, yeah. Just quickly, walk, quick fire what they are. So you've obviously got AFTV. So AFTV, um, we've got DR Sports, we've got uh, On Track GP, which is a brand new uh, F1 channel that um, we've started as well. So. They're the three uh, principal ones, um, but yeah, um, they keep us busy. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? and how are you making a decision on when to pull a trigger on some of those uh, experiences, and I guess even what looking at next because um, you've only really. When you I say mean, pull the trigger, what do you mean get rid of? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean that's the wrong terminology there. More like, right, to get them started. To get them started. How do you want to go? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah let's. That's an idea, and actually, let's let's crack on with that. Let's All do right. it. So the, the the F one channel was an interesting one because. On DR Sports, which was, you know, started up to cover all sports, um, principally football, Premier League football, but all sports, we were doing F1 on there and it was going really well. But what was happening was, because F1 clashes so much with football, um, we'd have occasions where we got a decision to make, you know what I mean? Is it the Monaco Grand Prix or is it Manchester United versus Man City? And the football always wins out because it just gets so much more big numbers. But then you get the people who follow the F1 who've been, you're building up a following with them and they're moaning and they're saying, no, well, why have you dropped, you know, you, and you get it because um, that's what they're into. So we're like, we need to create its, this in its own channel mm. um, and give it, give the F1 its full love. So that's why we decided that we're going to do an F1 channel and we set that up and it's got its own dedicated channel now where, you know, 
that channel is all about F1. Um, and I reckon we might face a similar thing with boxing because we do a lot of boxing um, and cover a lot of fights on DR as well. The, the only difference is, I guess, with DR is that, um, sorry, it was, it's with the boxing. Is like they don't really clash as much because a lot of the fights are on later on in the evening after football's finished. So, yeah, you do sort of know, need to know when to trigger. You know, um, should we be doing, like I was thinking, should we have a channel dedicated to women's football? Um, it's one of the things I was thinking about at one time. And then I thought, no, actually, I like the fact that it's all together. Mm. Um, I, I kind of think sometimes with women's football, I don't like the way it's, it's just labelled all the time. It is football played by women, is how I more like to look on it. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, you, I, I guess you kind of know yeah. when something will need to, you know, or we need to do something, you know. And one of the things I think we do well on DR um, is we sort of, it's sort of word, this buzzword that's going around, sporttainment. Mm -hmm. But we've been doing that from day one in that we, you know, we put a very, with a lot of the shows, we, we've got a show called Best of Enemies, which is on DR, which is probably our biggest show which on that show, like we look at, it's essentially, it's essentially a preview show, but it's with me, I present as an Arsenal fan and the other presenter as a Tottenham fan and hence the title Best of Enemies. Mm. Um, and we just have a whole laugh about football and the games coming up and it's a real fun show. And we do a lot of that on DR because we, we see that as a very big thing within football, you know? Sometimes, we, we, sometimes football's too serious and I've seen a lot of the things that we've been doing over the years now spinning off into your skies and people like that as well. Yeah, well, one of, you kind of touched on a question that I want to ask in a couple of different ways. You talked about, you know, the, yesterday being around a bunch of broadcasters and feeling like, you know, almost not necessarily you know, a little imposter syndrome. And then you also talked about sportainment and sort of what that is. But I actually think what's interesting in talking about this is you guys are actually digitally native in terms of socially native in some ways like yes sky sports is going to have its subscriber base and of that legacy but they're actually because of that legacy almost tied back in some ways in terms of the type of content they can produce yeah. whereas you guys were born in this era i guess you could say so maybe sort of what do you see is perhaps a mistake or um, a shortcoming or potentially limitations that those broadcasters have when it comes to content compared to what you guys have given mm. you've grown up in this era? Well, yeah, we've grown up. I haven't got an imposter syndrome in <laughs> yeah. the actually, in that I did used to. Yeah. I did used to probably back in the day, I'd be in uh, at an event or when I think, oh, the, the, the big boys are here. But now I look on it different. I'm like, yeah, we're, we are just as big as you. It just obviously we don't have the budgets and all that that you guys have. And we, it, we, we accept that and we're different to you. But, um, I, I just think, yeah, we've grown up in it. We know it inside out. We we know, kind of know what your audience wants. And I think the other thing that's really a big advantage I see it as for us, right, is that our content goes worldwide. Now, obviously with a lot of broadcasters, um, if you take say a Sky, a BT, even BBC, you know, they're rights holders. So if you're, for instance, watching, I don't know, Sky in the UK, if you go to the US, it's not Sky, it's a US broadcaster. If you go to Australia, mm -hmm. it'd be Australian broadcaster. If you go to the Middle East, it's be in sport. And so every, you know, they're all different rights holders. Whereas the what I see is a real advantage to us. We make original content that doesn't need rights. We don't show the football game. We don't show the highlights, so we don't need no rights. All of our content that we're making is original, right? Around football, it's original content. So every bit of content that we put out goes around the world. It goes across every border, every, you know, if I, if I put a video out right now, you can watch that video in Australia, you can watch it in America, you can watch it, you know, it's not geo-blocked anywhere, right? It goes right across the world. And I see that as a big advantage, especially going forward you know, um, with how I'm looking to become like a digital broadcaster that's like right across the world. Because you, we go across all borders. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one thing that I do see as an advantage for us. Um, and hence why 
he used to like I, I, I used to have a bit of him, imposter syndrome a bit like when I used to go abroad at first and I'd go somewhere and get mobbed I'm thinking how they how they know me so well yeah. like you know I was at the World Cup in Qatar and I came out of the game with a I'm not going to embarrass him but with a Sky <laughs> broadcaster he's you know we, we he's a good we get on well and we were walking and nobody knew who he was nobody and I was getting stopped like every 10 seconds to take a picture and he wow. goes he goes Robbie he goes bloody hell man he goes <laughs> nobody knows me they all know you but you see what he didn't maybe get is that the fact that in England they'll know you but mm. over here they're not because they never see your content or unless they've got a VPN or something yeah. whereas our stuff goes everywhere yeah. and that is one advantage that I feel making original content that we make you know we have it's a really good point uh, you mentioned the budget side of things I mean to give people a sense of you know the, one of the things those big broadcasters can do is they can generate a lot of revenue off the live rights and subscribers mm. and so forth you don't have that avenue no. to that mm. so how do you um, drive the income for, to fu fund the sustainable model like this and to be able to continue to invest and grow it? Because, you know, YouTube ad revenue is is mm -hmm. one obvious, obvious area, but it's still not exactly at the premiums that a lot of people are hoping it will get to in, in the mm. future. So just talk about talk us through what are some of the other avenues you can generate income to, to fund mm. those things. And some of the other, some of the other platforms well, don't yeah. even pay those revenues. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, like your... TikToks <clears throat> and that, although they're saying they are gonna. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously we're trying to get more and more of our content um, sponsored as well. So we are competing. Listen, that is where the, obviously the broadcasters, they've got the rights. Um, so they're easily, more easily able to attract. And plus as well, they've got the legacy mm. of always been working with these uh, companies and you get some big companies that don't understand um, the reach of platforms like us <clears throat> or don't really look on it and treat it with the same sort of or treat it in the same way that they treat the reach of a of a say a you know traditional broadcaster but it's starting to change they're starting to realize now they're starting to look, to, to look at the figures and look at the numbers and look at the reach and the more most important thing the engagement that you know, platforms like us get, and they're starting to realize that actually, if we put our products with these guys, it's gonna get a better reach and a better response than it does with just putting it with a traditional broadcaster. So it is starting to change. But yeah, I would stay the traditional broadcasters. Obviously, they still have the advantage. They've been doing that from day one, and they still have a great product as well. But I really do think that we're really making headway into that now. We're getting more and more sponsors um, coming on board and you know I think there's been issues in the past obviously as well brand safety and stuff like that but they you know like the way we're doing stuff they're starting to really trust us and see how we um, how we approach everything and that is an area that's really starting to to um, to grow for us as well so yeah very important area because as you said you know to grow what we're trying to do to sustain that you know you you do need but it is changing. Yeah. It really is changing. I think brands are getting it more now. But yeah, I mean, just you, sorry to jump into you right. there. You've only got to look at like some of even if we come out of um, football, I mean, look at these guys like these KSIs and, and how they've been able to put on mm. these huge boxing fights and things like that. And when they were first doing it, were ridiculed. Who are these idiots? Mm. No <laughs> one's going to turn up. Who's going to watch it? And now you see all the big sponsors wanting to work with them, big broadcasters wanting to work with them and that because they see the audience that these guys can pull, you know? And the and what well, I think also the challenge we've got in sort of UK media market is that's still an area that's taking a little bit more work, but the US is much more on top yeah. of that stuff. They're really always looking for opportunities mm. to get an edge, particularly on the brand side. I mean, you think about other broadcast um, players out there like, I don't know, Pat McAfee uh, show is kind of one I think about, which is it's not quite the same thing, but there's a, there's a, a layer of similarity there and they committed to it and were able to then generate, a, get a huge deal by a big major partner in FanDuel to generate, was it circa mm. 30 million a year? And then now they've done that ESPN deal to go back to, to mainstream. So my question for you is, uh, any conversations with FanDuel going on? Are we going to see you uh, <laughs> pop up an ESPN anytime well, soon? Go, yeah, bring them up. I remember years ago we did something with FanDuel, but I was like, it weren't on that scale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Certainly weren't on that scale, but if they want to come back and talk, yeah, <laughs> let's <bet>. do it. <laughs> the um, the types of partnerships though that you do do, I'm just curious, just for, give people a sense of maybe there's other the brands that are listening to this or um, for people to get a sense of who are doing their own thing, just how do you bring a brand into the mix and, and bring them as part of the mm. sponsor, sponsor of this? I imagine also one of the X factors here is that if you can be very blatant with it and say these guys are helping us do what we do, fans will support those companies. Yeah, right? yeah. I think, it, you know what, the key to it is to like, if you find a brand that also is really willing to work with you so that you can say to them, right, this is what the audience likes um, and this is a way to get you guys like involved. Like, And it's like, it's organic. Because when you, when, you, when you can um, get a brand to work with you and and the con the adverts and all that come across as organic. Everybody wins. Mm. Everybody wins. You know, I mean, you, you, we we've done content. Um, we did some stuff recently with a company called NordVPN, and it's like literally people. What I'm I'm going to games and people are stopping me, and it's like yeah, that advert you guys did with NordVPN that was oh, that was really funny. That was, I mean, they actually enjoy. They've looking at it like it's a bit of content. Yeah, yeah. You know, and um, they saw a real uptick you know, with, with people signing on and stuff like that. So when you work together, when, when you're dealing with content creators, because, you know, sometimes you've got to run your ads in a slightly different way yeah. instead of just like, you know, slapping a, you know, brand sticker in the corner or something. There's more innovative ways of making yeah. your your content really, your, your um, product really come across, so. So you guys are creating some ads with them, making, have a bit of fun with it. Yeah. You're also integrating them into the, some of the shows as yeah. well? Yeah, like uh, I'll give you another example. We, we've been sponsored by uh, one of our shows by Boohoo Man for quite a long time actually. They've been on board for about four years. And um, we do a thing on this show, which is called a Bias Premier League show. We do this thing where it's almost like a roundup of the weekend's games on AFTV. And we'll have uh, Boohoo Man of the Week. So, you know, which will basically your man of the match type style thing, right? And they, that's part of the show. Then mm -hmm. that's become now, you know, it's just such a popular feature, you yeah. know, that, you know, every week we choose who we think was our Boohoo Man of the Week. And yeah. just little things like that is the easy ways of integrating it into, yeah. you know. Just on, and finally on the sort of the business front, the, um, You've got a, a huge, a huge fan base and audience. You also have an app you've talked about, uh, yep. briefly mentioned as well. Um, are fans of, of your content able to subscribe and, and to additional supplementary services like a premium proposition, or yeah. is that to access the content? What's the what's at, the, at the moment? Our app's free, so um, is is free at the moment. We are talking about maybe having a sort of subscription side of it, mm -hmm. not not. You know, so making it free, but for additional content, yep. you can you can pay a bit extra. But yeah, the, the app's like a great feature. We got we got this feature on it called Fan Zone, which basically after a game we do call-in shows, and you can just literally just press a button on the app, and you're through to our virtual green room, and you can come on the show and you can talk. And we get fans from all over the world after every game. We rolled it on to DR the other night. We had loads of West Ham fans coming on. West Ham fans from Canada, from America coming on, you know, happy, right? Um, so that's a really good feature. And yeah, I mean, everything we do is about fans. That The fans are at the center of absolutely every bit of content, everything we're thinking of is fan driven. And I know a lot of, you know, I've been to a lot of sh conferences like your guys' ones and, and and I often see a lot of people, you know, up on the stage. So we're all about the fans, and, and I'm sometimes on there. Go, yeah. oh, are you? <laughs> are you sure about that? You know, because you know, it's, it's, a lot of people use it as a buzzword. But are they really yeah. doing stuff for the fans? And if they do, there's so much um, to gain. I look at a lot of football clubs, for instance. I'm like, you've got, you've got, you've already got the fans. You've got a huge fan base. But how you interact with them and how you, it's so poor. Before we move into talking about the fans and the content, I do have one other business question I want to ask is around mm. what you guys are doing maybe from a GFN perspective or possibly what you're doing from a B2B perspective, because obviously you've built this out from an Arsenal perspective, but you guys won't be the only fan TV channel. 
Uh, how are you being able to perhaps use your services, given the fact you guys were kind of got the godfathers, for mm. you know, lack of a better term, in terms of potentially sort of saying, these are this is how we do. These are the services we have. Is there potentially a B two B element of this as well? Yeah. Well, we've we, you know we've there's been other channels like for instance United View, who as you say they, they rent a studio from us um, just below and we help them with a lot of stuff and we've been able to show them how we've built what we've done. Obviously, I don't like Man United, <laughs> but it's all about it's all, it's all about helping. Even this how how I look on it right is like just like the Premier League. You've got the Premier League and basically every single club in that Premier League wants to win the title, wants to be successful. Nobody wants to go down and that. But the one thing they've done really successfully, and I always say this to other guys who are doing channels and stuff like that, I said, the one thing the Premier League have done successfully is they work together. And that's why the league is so strong, right? And that's why they all get good TV money. It's not like in Spain where it's only Real Madrid and Barcelona do their own deals and shut everybody else out. And then uh, subsequently you've got two really powerhouses and nobody else is, can compete. And so the interest in that league is not as strong as the Premier League where there's more competition. So I say to other guys, let's all work together. And that's what I'm trying to do with GFN. I'm trying to build um, this thing where we, you know, we have loads of football teams and not just the Premier League, we have it around the world and loads of other um, influencers and that. And, we go to the market together and that's what GFN is, is, is building. We're, we're building that where it's almost like a collective of all these channels and influencers. And um, yeah, I, I see really big things with that going forward in the future. So in, in that instance, big, back to the, the partnership side, are you guys going out as a, as a group there and saying, we can give you all this access to yeah. all of this audience collectively? Yes. And how, how's that reception been for that? Or is that only you guys? That's a, there's been a good reception for that. So, you know, it's like, you know, it's because, as I said, it's how the Premier League works. Mm. We go together, you know, so, you know, and, you know, also helping to empower other talented people who are out there who are building their channels or, you know, maybe a different team, but they're just really, really talented. You know, we help to empower them as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a movement now. It's like a movement. So switching more to the content side, and we talked a little bit about this beforehand, but <clears throat> it's interesting that some teams are, I guess, a little bit more progressive than others. But what do you see maybe perhaps you would, or maybe you'd like to see more of working with the teams in terms of, like you said, you really say you're about the fans, but how much are you actually letting the fans be a part of that? And I get there's that scary line of, you know, if you would ask West Ham fans in uh, January what they thought of David Moyes versus how they feel about him now, you would have got different answers. But how can you find that relationship with teams to perhaps provide more access or What's that, that like, that relationship? Mm. I think there's no point sometimes <coughs> in trying to hide. You, you are yeah. right. If you ask West Ham fans, you know, um, a few months ago about David Moyes, <laughs> it'd be a lot different to what they'd say today. And I'm not saying that, you know, a, a football team should have, like, week in, week out, loads of people coming on and being very negative about it. I, I know they can't do exactly what we do. But you do have to be more open and engaging. There's no point if you're having a bad season, you're having a bad season. You can't gloss it over, not no more. You could have done that maybe 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Now with social media, if you're not talking about it, someone else is, right? So you're, you know, if you're not having a quite an open discussion about it, your same West Ham fans are over there talking about it on Twitter, they're talking about it on Talk Sport, they're talking about it on various platforms all around. So why not sometimes a bit more honesty? Don't have to be, as I said, you don't go, is it, but a bit more honesty, you know? Yeah, we're having a bit of a tough time. You know what I mean? You get more people at the club sort of talking to the fans. Fans, when you communicate with them, they're, you'd be surprised at how more receptive they are. They'll be like, okay, all right, we kind of understand now. Well, you know, it hasn't quite, if, if somebody came out and said, you know, it's not quite working out, but there's a lot of tactics that we've been trying to, um, get across that haven't quite worked out but believe you me we're trying you know we even want to invite a few into if you guys into the training ground come and have a look at how hard we're working behind the scenes to get things right in set pieces or when you do things like that fans appreciate that fans are like okay 
because we, we, we know every team can't win every week. And fans, you know, it won't be every fan, but a lot of your fans will be like, okay, fair enough, the club's talking to us. But if you just ignore them and you just carry on like you pretend like everything's all right and then the first time a fan hears from you is you're trying to sell him a shirt, mm. then you're met with negativity. It's like yeah. people are like, well... He didn't want to say nothing to us about what's been going on. He didn't want to say anything to us about any of these circumstances. Now you want to sell me a shirt for eighty pound. You know what you can do with your shirt? Yeah. Take that and <laughs> you know what I mean that's what happens. Yeah. So clubs need to learn to talk. We're no longer in that era where you just circle the wagons. Can't do it no more. Like even even the shows that are on TV, um, like your Skies and that, they dissect things. Just like our, I mean, they, they, they do it. Your Gary Neville's and um, Carragher's and they, they're all dissecting it. Roy Keane, can, Roy Keane can be harsher than any fan out there, you know, sometimes yeah. when he's talking. So I think the tact has to be a bit different with clubs. Talk to your fans and try and create content, you know, that they can then appreciate. It's not just, not every bit of, there's a lot of clubs, right? All their content is just when they, it's an advert. What's your relationship like with the, the Arsenal Football Club? My, um, our relationship with Arsenal, well, I, I say it's good, right, in that I wouldn't say we're close, close, close in that, you know, we don't get the access that I see some other YouTubers get that follow clubs, like where they're at the training ground and they're at the press conferences all the time and that. But Arsenal, they do allow us to film at the ground. Um, I When I see any of their sort of officials and that, I have a decent relationship with them. Um, so I say it's good, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say it's like as good as I, I, I wouldn't say it's as close as what I see mm. some other influencers, like the guys at Man United, they'll be like pit side and we don't really get that type of access. But listen, I, I don't really mind because my focus is on the fans anyway. So it's on the fans that follow the club first and foremost. In Not, to be honest, like I've been, I remember going to a game um, abroad one time, it was a pre-season tour. And I was given like full access to the mix zone and everything like that. And I said, oh, thank you. But I'd rather be outside speaking to the fans after the game. I know that these players anyway, they're going to walk past and not really say much. So I didn't even take it up. So so I'm not sure how I'm going to frame this into a question, but it's something Nick has mentioned and you know, you can take it from me that one of the things we talk about is like almost the sports ecosystem is broken a little bit in the sense of <clears throat> most of the money is coming from the broadcasters into the rights holders but like nick for example because he's family man actually watches very little live sports and now i watch a lot of live sports but still percentage wise probably the majority of what i watch is on youtube and it's this interesting question of the way you kind of look and you split up the pie of where the money is actually flowing versus where the content is actually being consumed like it feels like you guys really fit in that sweet spot and are almost disrupting the system because you would think as you say the premier league is they're the ones putting on the event they're the ones getting the sponsorship mm. they're the ones signing the broadcast deals but you know there's 90 minutes in a game versus how much content are you guys putting out in a week in yeah. terms of where like audience attention actually is like it almost seems like the system or at least where the money is going doesn't actually quite add, add up in terms of the actual amount of consumption that actually takes place. Um, You're spot on. You're spot on because I always say, I always break down football into three segments when it comes to content, right? So you've got pre-game. So that's all the stuff, all the chatter and talk that goes on before the game starts. So you've got, you know, the build up to the weekend of the game, right? So you've got, that's one segment and all the previews and that. Then you have the game itself which obviously, you know, I mean, that the rights holders have that and they're showing the game. And then after the game, the talking doesn't finish there. That it starts again. And then that can sometimes even be bigger than the actual game. Mm -hmm. All the talking points, all the various things. So you've got to be across all of it, you know, because, you know, the game only lasts 90 minutes. And like you said, you know, not, not every, especially in, in the UK, you know, um, you don't get to, unless you, unless you go to every game, how many times do you watch 90 minutes of your, your team every week? I'm, I'm lucky, I'm an Arsenal fan. Most of our games are shown live. A West Ham fan 
how many of your games are shown live. So, again, there's really missing out. I, I, I look at a lot of things even in broadcasting at the moment, like the 3 o'clock, the 3 p.m. kickoff thing is mm. so outdated and ridiculous. I hear broadcasters moaning, oh, our stuff is getting pirated. Well, it's your own fault. Come on. You've got to change that now. That was something that was bought in for a good reason, mm. you know, 20, 30 years ago, because you want to get more people going to the game. But it's outdated now completely outdated so that's the problem sometimes with some of the big broadcasters I feel and some of the big clubs is that they're too slow to react with what's going on you know you you look at something like YouTube that like and this is one thing I think the broadcasters have learned is that they'll have the highlights on after the game pretty quickly afterwards right and you look at some of the views some of those highlights get I, I bet you if you were to look at some of them they do better than the actual game itself. I bet you the majority of them would do, actually. Yeah, you know? I, so, I agree. Well, I'm not surprised that we also agree on the piracy thing. When I saw the 30 years prison sentence, you know, my opinion is like, you can't really blame pirates if you're not going to give people a legal option to watch the game. I, I get that's probably an out there sort of take, but for me, like, I've banged this drum multiple times on the podcast. It's like 48% of all Premier League matches will never be viewed legally in the UK. And to me, that's just... In the, U- the yeah. UK, is, re- yeah. and then yeah. you go abroad, right? And yeah. you'll speak to a fan. So, for instance, I remember when I first started doing AFTV and there'd be a lot of resistance to to fans from abroad, right? From English fans. Yeah. You're like, hey, what do they know? Yeah. They don't know nothing. We're the proper fans. We go. We-. And I remember when I first started going abroad following Arsenal, he's covering it. You speak to fans and I'm like, oh my God, he, he guy knows everything. He's got, he's, he's clued up, his knowledge is better than the guys, you know. And then I started to click. I'm going, these guys watch every single game live. Every one. Yeah. In England, unless you go to the game, you've not watched every game live. There's no way you're going to have knowledge of what Arsenal have done this season over those guys abroad, unless you go to the game. You know? So, you know, and... It's it's um yeah it's so outdated that three pm but it's still we're still doing it. So one of the things that we talk a lot about is the new age, the new fan, the the new era of fandom. Because I mean, so you're I find it interesting because your organisation has been built a lot around um, the AFTV, around Arsenal originally, and now you're expanding. But what we're seeing more and more across sports now is that. Um, fans follow athletes a lot as well. So they do jump from club to club quite often, mm. or maybe leagues in some instances. And, you know, but they, the story about just Messi just getting signed yeah. uh, to Miami is like they're getting a couple of hundred thousand followers uh, an mm. hour joining and following the club. Yeah, PSG so lost a million followers or something yeah. like that. On yeah. That, yeah. So I'm just wondering, do you see uh, and feel a lot of that? Because obviously you are serving the, the Arsenal fan at the heart. Are you seeing more of these fans that are, they are really passionate about it, but they, they do come with it more about, they, they, they guess they just look at it differently. They're looking at it more about the people yeah. than the, the clubs, or are you mainly focused on the, the club fans? At, I, I, I find that the fans, there are some fans like what, what you just described there, but I don't think that's the majority. I think fa- fans choose their club when they're abroad and then they're very, very passionate about their club and players move on and they'll stick with that club. It, I, I find that with the Premier League and I, I've been very, one of the things I've been very proud of, right, um, with what we've done on AFTV, for instance, is we've been able to show those fans abroad and show that they're not like how people think where they'll just move, you know, move from club to club. They are actually really loyal. They wake up at some ridiculous time sometimes mm. to watch their team. And they know their team inside out because, you know, they may not get to come to the Emirates, but they follow their team. I mean, we went over to Nigeria and we did a watch party over there. The passion of these fans was unreal, you know what I mean? And as I said, they knew everything. They knew every detail. You know, if you used to go over there now in transfer season, they know what players they want signed. They know. So I don't, I don't yeah, you'll get some, a small percentage of fans that, maybe jumps with wherever Ronaldo goes. But I think, I really do think that that's not, those fans are, are very loyal to so fans now to their clubs. So not expecting a Ronaldo fan TV uh, concept uh, anytime soon? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> no, no. I mean, what I am, what I am expecting though is uh, some sort of Saudi Arabia fan TV or something because the way in which, uh, 
you know, they're bringing players over. I, I see that. I, I see in the future that being, and I met a load of Saudi Arabian fans at the World Cup and they're very, very passionate about their football. So I do see that being a massive emerging market, you know? Yeah, well, I'm conscious, Nick, we're, we're running out on Robbie's time. And like you said, I'm just kind of counting down the seconds until there's a Declan Rice announcement because I don't want to get cut <laughs> off here. But I'll hand it over to you yeah. if you've got any closing just, up Just questions. a quick couple of questions before we wrap up. One mm. is that you, obviously your business has been the foundation to YouTube. And it's wondering what the relationship is like with YouTube. Do you actually work with them heavily to even talk about what's working, what's not, how to generate more revenue, how to partner? I hear that more and more now that they are doing more of that. And I don't know how much that plays out with you guys. No, I have a really good relationship with YouTube. I've got a really good partner manager, Isabella, she's brilliant. And um, I've done a lot of things for YouTube, like I've spoken on a lot of their events. I spoke at this brilliant event they did last year in Valencia, where they brought loads of influencers from right across the world. And like they asked me to speak and talk about how I built um, AFTV. They did a campaign on me. Um, last year where they had like billboards all over London and stuff like that where um, they called it from what was it it was from oh, I forgot the words they used now it was something like almost like from zero to um, broadcaster you know yeah. um, which was really cool and yeah I'm constantly speaking to them a lot of times when they've got like new innovations and that they'll they'll get on the call with me and say, Robbie, what do you think about this? This is something that we're thinking of developing. And, you know, we had a lot of talk with them when they were bring, talking about bringing out things like YouTube shorts and stuff like that. So now I have a very good relationship with uh, YouTube. I, I think, you know, YouTube has really helped me to get where I am yeah. today and, you know, allowing us to put it on a platform that's huge, mm. you know, so you can put your content on it and anyone can do it. That's the great thing about it. Um, in terms of, um, the future, I suppose. Like, where, where, where are you? Are you guys looking to have a specific roadmap ahead of like what's next? Are you just doubling down on what you're doing well and keep growing those audiences? Are you going to launch a number of new sports-related products? I mean, we've talked. You talked a little bit about mm. boxing. Is is there anything defined coming up that um, you know, we should yeah. keep an eye out for? The, the broadcast angle. I, I, I want us to be like uh, with GFN to be that platform that is literally a broadcaster but in done in a different way in a digital you know a digital broadcaster for us to be a digital broadcaster who broadcasts content worldwide and that you know this can grow and it can be in other sports as well i mean you could replicate this for the nba you could replicate this for the nfl you could replicate this in tennis in in any sport where there's fans basically any sport where there's passionate fans, this can be replicated for. So, yeah, I'm I'm looking to grow this as a, that's always been my thing. I want to grow this into being a like a digital broadcaster, and we're we're on our way to doing that as well. I feel. I mean, Tom is a digital broadcaster. Pre-game watch-alongs during the match, post-game reactions, news daily. That's that's a, that's about as broadcast as it comes. Yeah, so. yeah, twenty-four hours like a CNN. <laughs> I mean, twenty-four-seven. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, this is. The thing is, this is how people consume it now, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's not set times no more. Yeah. It is round the clock. You know I mean, it is like, and, and then you've got people in other time zones where they might be just waking up, they want their, you know, so that's how you have to be. I mean, it never stops. Yeah. It never, so you, you look at now in the summer, you know, you'd have thought the football season's finished, for instance. The amount of tran transfer news and you've seen the emergence of these guys like your Fabrizio Romano's has got like, you know, he's got like way, way, way more followers than broadcasters yeah, mad. speaking about transfer news, yeah. you know? So it just, and there's an appetite for it. There's a huge appetite for it, you know? So yeah, no, I, I think personally, I think I'm only just getting started. You know what I mean? I think like what's gone before has been great, but I'm really excited. And what as well drives this thing is uh, technology, you know, with that, the, the more technology gets better, like when you spoke earlier about live, you know, we can all go live on our phone right now to anyone in the world. Mm. So what's gonna come in the next five years? I mean, the AI stuff. Yeah. I, 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 I um, this company the other day sent me a video that I did and they said, Robbie, we want you to listen to this video, watch and listen to this video and see if you'd be interested in us doing something like this, right? 
and basically it, they dubbed me in Spanish using AI, but it's my voice. Yeah. I was like, what? I was like, I was, <laughs> I'm like, that is incredible. Mm. And I was just straight away, my mind's like, we could do this or yeah. we could. So the more technology improves, I think, uh, I think is the more, mm. you know, content is going to get better. You know what I mean? Um, we're seeing creators as well who are creating content all around the world. I mean, you know, there's there's some great guys doing football content in Africa, in Australia, America, everywhere. You know, and I think that's going to come more to the fore as well. So I, I think it's really exciting times. I really do. I agree. I think uh, the fan perspective and I think the, the niche that you guys have built yourself in, as you say, like Nick and I said, the majority of the content I watch is content that you guys produce, not what the broadcasters produce. And there's just going to be more ways, like you said, whether that's because technology is enabling it, where there's going to be new monetization models or sponsors and advertisers become more aware that if I'm trying to attract a certain audience, I'm not going to get it on a pay TV subscription. Mm. I'm going to get it on a free platform, a TikTok, a YouTube, things like that. I totally agree that this is really going to start. And, you know, I really appreciate uh, the story kind of hearing where it built up and certainly, you know, best of luck moving forward. And yeah, no, it's been you. great to have you. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for having me, you know, and um, appreciate being told the story. And um, like I said, it's exciting times, I feel. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the next 10, we, 10 we, years. And we look forward to following it, that's for sure. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. All right. Cool. Well, thank thank you. you so before, much. Before we get up, we've got to do a behind the scenes selfie or else okay. the, <laughs> my, my production and marketing team won't be happy with me.